this is the voice of freedom, General MacArthur speaking. People of the Philippines, I have returned. By the grace of Almighty God, our forces stand again on Philippine soil, soil consecrated in the blood of our two peoples. Douglas MacArthur is a legendary American hero. He defeated a Japanese in World War II and took back the Philippines. But in order to take back the Philippines, MacArthur had to lose it in the first place. In World War II, the Japanese defeated MacArthur and killed or captured his entire army of 30,000 Americans and 120,000 Filipinos. Historian Gavin Long considers MacArthur's defeat to be the greatest in the history of American foreign wars. How did MacArthur and America lose this badly? And why does it feel like no one remembers this huge defeat? In 1935, the world was on the brink of war. Hitler and the Nazis were on the rise in Germany, and Japan had invaded and conquered parts of China. Tensions were high between Japan and America. But MacArthur was having the time of his life in the Philippines. The legendary general was living in a penthouse suite in Manila's finest hotel. He partied with Manila's elite. He even had two salaries, making him the highest paid soldier in the world. The Philippines didn't have an army at this time, and Japan's invasion of China had been worrying America. So MacArthur was tasked with creating a Philippine army and planning the defense of the Philippines. MacArthur had the power to do whatever he wanted, and with war on the horizon, every day of preparation was crucial. The first thing MacArthur did was throw himself a party. Before even recruiting a single soldier, he held a grand ceremony at Malacanang Palace, the Philippines' version of the White House. On top of this, he commissioned a special hat for himself. This hat, decorated with gold, is the iconic hat that appears in most of his photos. MacArthur wasn't just a general, he was a celebrity. Eisenhower, yes, that Eisenhower, who was MacArthur's right-hand man at the time, commented on this, saying, It was pompous and rather ridiculous to be the field marshal of a virtually non-existent army. After MacArthur's ceremony, he got to work and spent the next few years planning his defense and building his army. From the get-go, the Philippines was an inconvenience for the U.S. On one hand, it couldn't be totally abandoned. U.S. military leaders saw the abandoning of the Philippines as the U.S. abandoning its influence in Asia. On the other hand, they didn't want to make a huge effort to defend it. The Philippines is 7,000 miles from the U.S. and consists of 7,000 islands, making it near impossible to defend. On top of this, Roosevelt prioritized fighting the war in Europe. The U.S. settled on a half measure, sending a small number of troops and equipment to the Philippines. To make things worse, the Philippine government was in the process of gaining independence from the United States. The Philippine Senate was often resistant to U.S. military aid and opposed the presence of U.S. bases. MacArthur was to put together an army under these conditions, without unified support from both governments. Fast forward to 1941. Despite the less than ideal conditions, MacArthur had assembled an army consisting of 150,000 men, a small force of light tanks, artillery, and 181 planes, including some of the most modern aircraft in the U.S. military, B-17 Flying Fortresses and B-40E Warhawks. This sounds impressive, but there were major problems. Out of the 150,000 men, only 10,000 were trained and equipped frontline fighting troops. Most of the Americans were trained to fight in support roles, and the largest portion of the army, the Filipino troops, were severely undertrained and under-equipped. The Filipino troops only had five months to train and were taught a mix of military, educational, and vocational subjects, not allowing for a full military training. Eisenhower pointed this out to him 
But Buck Arthur didn't see any problem with this. The army was short on guns, ammunition, and even clothing and boots. Some of the Filipino soldiers were barefoot, and due to gun shortages, most weren't able to train with guns until the war started. Despite all these problems, the ever-confident MacArthur didn't see any issue. And in fact, he repeatedly assured Roosevelt and top military leaders that he could defend the Philippines from the Japanese. In addition to the botched training, MacArthur made several mistakes while planning the defense of the Philippines by going against the rest of the military. For decades, the military had been crafting a war plan in case a war with Japan broke out. The result of this planning, War Plan Orange, was the blueprint for defeating Japan. This was to be followed by the whole military in case of a war. On a side note, the US also had war plans for fighting the UK, Canada, Australia, and even Ireland. Under War Plan Orange, the army was to stay behind in the Philippines and fight a delaying action around Bataan and Corregidor. Holding Bataan and Corregidor meant that the Japanese wouldn't be able to use Manila's ports. Later on, reinforcements from the US would relieve the Philippine defenders and take back the rest of the Philippines. War planners determined that defending the beaches of 7,000 islands wasn't feasible. MacArthur disagreed. He advocated for a more aggressive strategy, believing that the Japanese could be held at the beaches. MacArthur overruled other military planners, diverting men and supplies to the beach defenses and keeping the retreat to Bataan and Corregidor as a backup in case the beaches fell. This single decision would later prove disastrous during the war. On top of this, MacArthur underestimated the Japanese, believing that they could only invade the Philippines on April 1942 at the earliest. MacArthur's beach defenses were greatly unprepared for the catastrophe that would come in early December 1941. On December 8, 1941, 3.30 a.m. Philippine time, MacArthur's headquarters received unofficial news that Pearl Harbor was bombed. Under War Plan Orange, MacArthur was to mobilize his air force and strike nearby Japanese forces and bases. For reasons unknown to historians to this day, MacArthur did nothing and refused to speak to his men. At 5.30 a.m., MacArthur received confirmation of the war with Japan and he was ordered to begin air raids. MacArthur did nothing. At 6.15 a.m., MacArthur received news of a Japanese air raid in the southern Philippines. MacArthur still did nothing. This whole time, MacArthur's officer in charge of his air force, General Louis Brereton, was pleading for MacArthur to mobilize the planes. But MacArthur's chief of staff, General Richard Sutherland, blocked him from speaking with MacArthur. At 10.14 a.m., MacArthur finally gives the go signal to bomb the nearby Japanese force in Taiwan. The bombers can finally begin preparing for takeoff. At 11.30 a.m., one of the two radars in the Philippines detected an incoming force of Japanese planes. These planes were actually late due to fog in Taiwan, but just in time to catch the American bombers preparing to take off. Clark Air Base scrambles fighters, but by then, it's too late. The Japanese bomb Clark, destroying the bombers, most of the fighter planes, and the radar system, escaping with barely any casualties. The American fighters in outdated anti-air defenses only shoot down seven Japanese planes. The mood was, was awful, sadness. All we saw were buildings blown up, tents blown up, bodies flying all around, and nothing was intact. We lost all of our airplanes. It was a devastation. 
and we were very, very, very disturbed, very sad about what was going on. Other airfields in the Philippines are bombed without much resistance. On the first day, MacArthur loses his entire air force before a single Japanese soldier even sets foot in the Philippines. Two days later, on December 10, the Japanese start landing on Philippine shores, confident that they won't be bombed by U.S. planes. Led by General Masaharu Homa, the well-equipped and well-trained Japanese quickly overwhelm MacArthur's beach defenses, and MacArthur's forces lose every battle. In a few weeks' time, MacArthur's navy is in full retreat to Australia. Without an air force and navy, and with the beach defenses in disarray, on December 23, MacArthur finally admits that the beaches can't be held, and he issues a full retreat to Bataan, in line with the original pre-war strategy. Because MacArthur diverged from War Plan Orange and decided to defend the beaches, huge amounts of supplies and equipment were left at the beaches, leaving Bataan with a fraction of the supplies needed. On January 6, MacArthur's forces completed the retreat and dug in and prepared to defend Bataan. They initially held off the Japanese, but with a serious lack of food and supplies, it's only a matter of time until they're defeated. Back in the US, the military determines that the Philippines is a lost cause. But for morale purposes, MacArthur is ordered to keep fighting. Months pass and Bataan is still heroically resisting but living on borrowed time. US High Command starts to fear the morale blow to its army if MacArthur, its most high-profile general, is captured. On March 11, MacArthur, his family, and his staff were evacuated to Australia, leaving behind his men. Exhausted, starving, and surrounded by the Japanese army, MacArthur's forces surrendered a month later on April 9, 1942. The surviving 70,000 men are subjected to horrific atrocities committed by the Japanese army, including the Bataan Death March. In May, Corredor surrenders and the Philippines falls under Japanese control. Most of the U.S. and Filipino forces are either killed or captured, while a few survivors form guerrilla groups to resist the Japanese occupation. In the span of four months, MacArthur completely loses his entire arm of 150,000. Due to poor planning and some bad luck, MacArthur and the U.S. were utterly defeated. The defeated MacArthur arrives in Australia, and despite his utter failure in the Philippines, He's awarded the Medal of Honor. It turns out that this whole time, the U.S. had been playing up his feats in the Philippines, making him seem like a hero for resisting the Japanese. This was during the early stages of World War II, where the Allies were losing every battle. The U.S. needed a hero to rally behind, and they manufactured one with MacArthur. And the American public ate this up. All of a sudden, Americans were naming babies, parks, and even streets after MacArthur. He became an even bigger celebrity than he already was. It was at this time that MacArthur's fame reached insane heights. And maybe this is why, up to this day, he never had the answer for his failures in the Philippines. To get a Medal of Honor for being defeated, MacArthur was possibly the luckiest soldier in the world. While in Australia, he makes numerous public speeches saying that he'll return to the Philippines. After two years and several U.S. victories in the Pacific, MacArthur had his sights on the Philippines. And in October 1944, he arrived in the Philippines with a massive army. This is where we hear his most famous speech and get this famous picture. While the Americans favored a defense around Bataan, the Japanese resisted the American invasion all throughout the Philippines, fighting in the mountains and jungles. Manila wasn't spared, and the Japanese fought tooth and nail to defend it. After a brutal year of fighting, the Philippines was liberated on August 15, 1945. Manila was completely leveled in the battle to take it back, becoming the second most devastated allied city in World War II. And hundreds of thousands of Filipinos are dead or missing all throughout the Philippines. Out of MacArthur's original force of 150,000, only around 30,000 are alive as prisoners of war 
or as slaves in Japanese labor camps. MacArthur returns to a wounded and barely breathing Philippines, but he's welcomed as a hero and is remembered as one to this day. At the start of the video, I asked, why is it that 80 years later, his defeat and the surrender of the Philippines is seemingly forgotten? Textbooks mention these events, but they're often mentioned in passing. In the Philippines, he's practically worshipped, loved by the Filipinos even more than he is by the Americans. I only learned about MacArthur's defeat later on in life, thanks to a great history professor. At the end of the day, MacArthur might have just gotten lucky. He was at the right place at the right time. America needed a hero, and the US turned him into one. It didn't help that his actions in the Philippines were never investigated. After Pearl Harbor, the US immediately investigated what went wrong and punished its officers in charge of Pearl Harbor. Admiral Husband Kimmel and General Walter Short were relieved of their command just 10 days after the Pearl Harbor bombing. It seems to me that despite his defeat, his celebrity status and war hero image just stuck. MacArthur has had his fair share of critics, but it's a bit frustrating knowing that his defeat in the Philippines is pretty much forgotten. A lot of ordinary people have their lives changed forever during these times. My own grandmother was a child when the Japanese invaded. She and her family had to flee their homes in the middle of the night to escape the Japanese bombings. Later on, they lived in fear during the Japanese occupation. Of course, MacArthur isn't to blame for every bad thing that happened during those times. In 2022, how have we changed since then? Do we still have a problem with worshipping people that don't deserve it? Do we still have a problem with choosing which events to remember and which to forget? Learning from the past is important, but understanding what we choose to remember is equally important and can tell us a lot about ourselves. It feels like in the age of social media, there's only so much space in our minds and we can't remember everything. I'm honestly not sure where we'll go from here. 80 years later, in 2102, will we be any different? And which events from the past decade will still be remembered? Thank you for listening to me ramble about MacArthur and memory for 20 minutes. MacArthur had a really interesting life and so much of it had to be cut to keep the video from being too long. Richard B. Frank's book, MacArthur, was a primary source used for this video and I can't recommend it enough. I hope you enjoyed the video and I'll see you all next time.